Welcome to Dr. G at the Heart of Healthcare. Today, we have a special guest from the community here in San Diego, Mr. Jason McDonald, the Executive Director of Active Care Bressy Ranch. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, Dr. G. <laughs> Glad to be here. So today, listeners, we're going to talk about when is it time for memory care? A lot of folks often say they will never put their wife, husband, mother, father in a home. Um, but Sometimes people need to move their home to a new place. So today we're going to talk about memory cares in one of our wonderful uh, communities here. So let's let the listeners know what's up. Thank you. I think that's an excellent intro and something that uh, people don't face until they have to face it. And um, although we do find that many families have that conversation uh, you know, promise me you'll never put me into a home. And um, uh, people make that promise. And unfortunately, it is um, many times not possible. It's, it's like saying, don't ever take me to a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no one wants to um, have to face a difficult situation or, or go through something hard, but at times it's necessary. And I think that's the heart of your question is, when do you know that it's necessary? And I love your idea of a, a new home and, and uh, finding a comfortable and appropriate new home for, for mom or dad or brother or sister. And with um, this situation, a lot of brothers and sisters now are being forced to uh, make those decisions for a sibling because of early onset dementia. So all of these things mm -hmm. have um, I think hit home for many more families than we'd like, but it's a, it's a reality that's great to talk about. Thank you for allowing me to share. Yeah. And so that, that's what I want to do. Normalize it because society put all puts all these, you know, stigmas on things and I cannot take credit for moving home. That's something uh, that I learned from Brenda Lee Smith. She's one of the senior care advisors around, uh, the communities from Oasis. And it, right. it was a light bulb moment for me. She said, when home is no longer serving your needs, you need to move home and you should move it early enough to where the person has an opportunity to get to know it and, you know, and, and, and find their, their way around. And so, that's something that needs to happen with, you know, folks who have dementia, various types of dementia, Alzheimer's and things like that. So maybe we should just back up and you could tell us what medically are you all looking for when someone is interested um, or find themselves in the situation of, of moving their residents to the memory care? What are we looking for on paper? On paper, it's uh, mild cognitive impairment, MCI, <clears throat> and that allows us to accept somebody that has early stages of forgetfulness, uh, dementia, and uh, many times uh, a doctor or a neurologist isn't uh, prepared to put down full-blown dementia on paper, so they'll put MCI or, um, you know, and, and, and that's just fine. And uh, that's one of the great things about our program is we're able to help residents with uh, in the various stages of dementia and, and depending on situations. If um, that's something I know you wanted to get into uh, about the different stages that we can assist families with. And if someone's uh, moving home and they have mild impairment, then we do have uh, a uh, area in our community that's set up specifically for those who are more high functioning and maybe just have some forgetfulness, need reminders. And then uh, the disease is a progressive disease. It's very sad. It's very difficult. And that's one of the things I know that you want to um, explain to people is it's that's, that's normal uh, that a person has that progression. And, and sometimes that's demonstrated by 
uh, incontinence, by wandering, by behaviors, and and those things can become scary for families. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then uh, obviously the final stages of dementia where a resident can no longer do anything for themselves. They need help with uh, their nourishment. They need help with their cleaning. They need help with everything. And uh, sometimes they have to have them their food and their medications uh, pureed or crushed or things like that, just because their whole body is starting to break down and, and enter those final stages. And, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, I, I know you and I don't want to share the, the hard parts of dementia to scare people, but we want to share it to let people know that um, there are resources to help through all of these difficult things and to, to make sure that uh, a person is, well cared for, but also has the opportunity to enjoy the life as best as possible when they, when a person has to face that. And that's really what I want to focus on is the, uh, what's available to allow a family to see their loved one in a good environment and, and have those opportunities to see good things in difficult times. Yeah, I love that. And maybe, you know, we could differentiate and I want to be careful with my words because I I never want to minimize the challenges of a caregiver. Um, but there's difficulties for the caregiver, but then there's the reality of the patient, my patient or your resident uh, and what they're experiencing. And we want to make sure that we are providing an environment that they can thrive in, that they can continue to have meaningful interactions with the world and, and be socialized. Uh, I recall a recent tour I had with you where, where a resident was on their, on their iPad, just having a blast talking to some family. And so those are the type of things that we want to see or, you know, someone is was acting like the greeter that day, you know, and I love how you have a very open concept to where we can see the various areas and it and it's like a family. That's what I I always want people to know. Home in these facilities, the folks there are, are wonderful. Your staff, um, the caregivers, the the other folks, they know each person by name and they make them feel important and a part of their community. And so I really want to focus on the needs of the patient. Well, you know, from my perspective, so that maybe someone listening to us or watching us on YouTube, they can say, you know what, maybe I should think about that, or maybe I should schedule a respite and, you know, kind of test it out Mm -hmm. so they can see that their mom, their dad, their sister, brother, or whoever, husband or wife would, would do well there and, and they can go visit them. Absolutely. That's great. And we definitely want people to have the opportunity to, to give it a try. Respites are available and that's a, a great way to take a break. Even the caregiver, we there's caregiver burnout. That's a reality. It happens every day. And that's one of the times that we do talk to families is um, maybe a wife wants to go back to being the wife and not the full-time caregiver because um, we say in, in we all know it's not humanly possible to give care 24 hours a day and and people are forced into that role Mm -hmm. and they can get burned out and, and um, we don't want that. And so it is, it is true and it's possible to go back to being the loved one instead of the full-time caregiver. And, And that's really one of the things that we offer. And the, you talked about the iPad, some of the technology advances are, are really exciting. Some of them we put into use during the, the pandemic and mm-hmm. that was sad, but it was also useful to, to see that residents could understand using uh, video chat. And so uh, maybe loved ones who are further away and can't come every week or whatever are able to, to do that. So that's fun. And um, it has been pretty functional for almost all residents in, in, almost all stages of dementia, they, they still kind of get that, having that voice in the face to correspond to someone that they love 
they usually are able to connect. I have one resident who uses his iPad to watch football games. And so, Oh, I love it. Who's his team? Yeah. Who's his yeah. team? Do you um, know the team? <laughs> I, I believe he's a 49ers fan. Oh, so no. I don't okay, know. So I don't see, know. Look, oh. my, my listeners know. Uh, uh, no, no, no. L.A. Okay. Rams over here. <laughs> you got it. Right. No, I love that he can watch yeah. the football games. And, yeah. He's That's a, what it's he's about. A, he's a sports fanatic. His nickname was Traveling Joe. And um, <laughs> he... <laughs> He loves, uh, he loves sports. And so that's really cool that he can still uh, enjoy that. And the, um, I, I have to mention this because you mentioned loving caregivers and those who, who are able to provide that. Um, our employee of the month this month, she's just a special person. And uh, she's been with us for more than a year and just really uh, has shown that this is her, this is her calling. This is her passion to help people. And she shows that she's so patient and she's so caring and she just, um, you know, guides the residents and helps them. And, um, we, we highlighted her and it's fun to put her in the newsletter for all the families to see, because I'm certain that a majority of our families have seen her in action and know that she definitely, deserves that recognition of being an employee of the month, but also just being a special person that does a job that not everybody can do. Awesome. And, uh, awesome. Yeah. Congrats to her. Congrats Absolutely. to her and, and kudos to you, you know, as frontline clinicians and workers, we rely on what well, we just thrive when we have leadership like you who, you know, give us good feedback and create the positive vibes. I was lucky this week to get some of that from, from work. And so it always feels good and keeps us going. We do this because, you know, right. it's our calling, like you said, but when leadership acknowledges us, it, it just makes all the difference. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. So I want to, Oh, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? Nothing. I, I appreciate it. I, the, the care team, deserves all the credit. I, I do very little and we cannot do what we do without wonderful people in all departments. And you think of even housekeeping and going in and they have yes. to be extra patient and loving to clean a room. And yeah, you know, the things could be misplaced every, every uh, hour. <laughs> and so <laughs> there's, they're, they're um, a special group and our dietary team just, you know, it, it's a little city here, right? We have every department yeah. that does all these uh, jobs that help people uh, be cared for. And when we hire people, we tell them that, you know, it, it's hard work, but it's rewarding. Our, our biggest reward is when you do get that pat on the back, especially from a, a family member that says, you know, you're so sweet to my loved one. Thank you for doing this. And, um, you know, that, that means everything to the team members who really give it their all. And so, they deserve it. Awesome. Well, I want to look at, go through some of the areas there just to kind of clarify. I took some notes when I, when I did my recent tour. So I want to just talk about the different levels. You told me you have a level one and a level two and then a central area. So maybe we can just kind of touch on that. Um, I'll just say my notes. Tell me if I got my notes right. This is you, my quiz. You, you did well. <laughs> yeah. So level one is what I see. Uh, it says club 90 percent of the inquiries when people are interested in in memory care. Um, those residents are standby assist. So they they need the caregivers to kind of supervise them when they're doing their own ADL cares. Those are activities of daily living, folks. And just as a refresher, the activities of daily living is. They are six things that you need to do the moment you wake up in the morning, right? What do you do? You got to get out of bed, transfer to the bathroom, use the bathroom, take a shower, put your clothes on, get to the table and eat your breakfast. Those are all those things. And so 
those are those are the things that we're kind of following in the late stages of life. And that's when we see our seniors slowing down. So standby assist is what, what they need help with. They're still communicating and making friends like some of those folks, maybe traveling Joe, watching his team. Um, and then you mentioned a central area and then you mentioned level two is where they have complete care. Um, they're likely on pureed meals because they, they have dysphagia, they're forgetting how to eat their food and, and all those things. So how do we determine that and how do families, just how, how does that work just briefly? I know it's complicated. We can't answer everything here, yeah. but I just want to give people a snapshot into this world and what they can expect. Thank you. The, a lot of times families notice uh, a problem. Uh, let's maybe it's the uh, the holiday meal, and you or you go you go to visit a loved one, and you see that they're really having trouble. They're not eating right. They're not taking care of themselves right, and so you're concerned, and you start making those inquiries. You know this isn't going to work out. That person um, can't live on their own, or um, you know, my uh, husband or wife have uh, been diagnosed with, with early onset dementia. And so there's sometimes there's a, a, a family concern and sometimes there's a medical professional involved that says this just isn't going to work for you to care for this person at home any longer. And, you, you know, we call the, the uh, location or it, it's a wing of the building that's specifically intended for those with with mild symptoms you know they're high functioning and we call that club club level and so that is a, a opportunity for residents to continue to socialize they they're able to communicate well um, I if you saw some of these residents maybe at the grocery store or, or something that they're with other uh, people. You wouldn't even know that they had dementia until you had a real detailed conversation or you noticed that they can't remember to um, do the basics ADLs that you were talking about. And mm -hmm. um, that then the level one care, um, is the residents, we talked about some of the hard things that we have to discuss with incontinence or inability to uh, remember to use their walker. So maybe they're even in a wheelchair now and they just have lost some of that ability in level one. And then level two, you mentioned was, is correct that they need full care. And uh, the, the process of determining that is one that's special to our company and, and active care has uh, a program that we do a full assessment prior to having someone move in and that is done by a nurse practitioner. And our nurse practitioner has you know, 20 plus years doing these assessments and knowing what to look for and spending time with a resident, uh, a future resident or a, a person in their environment. So we get to see what stage they're at and help make that decision with the family as to what is going to be the best area for them to move into. And that can be comforting to the family so that they know what to expect and they they get a, a baseline of you know where are we starting out and you know what what's important what are the things that we can all work on together um, I will say that we've had uh, a number of situations where a person's coming from the hospital and they're they're in a very poor condition they uh, maybe you're having very severe behaviors where they just, you know, that it's uncontrollable outbursts and, and uh, you know, wanting to uh, walk away or, you know, just those, those severe behaviors are difficult to deal with and hospitals are not set up to deal with that. And so a lot of times they'll restrain them and it's really, really sad to have someone uh, be in that position. And you can imagine the families uh, just don't know where to turn and, We've been lucky enough to help families be, we can be a resource by providing an environment for some people. Obviously we, we uh, there's no cure for dementia, but what we can do is our environment can help them. And that's the key. And, and this is based on 
many, many years of experience with, with these programs and even some of the technology that we talked about that people will respond to. And so can you imagine having a family member be at their wits end because this, their loved one is in the hospital and restrained and, and uncontrollable and we come up with a program that helps them uh, be in a state of comfort and maybe get back to even uh, sitting up in bed and communicating or walking or, you know, just having that opportunity to see them smile again and going from having them taken to the hospital, not knowing if they're even going to live and then having more time to spend with them. And, and that's a real blessing for us to see a turnaround like that. And sometimes it is possible, you know, I, I don't want to put hopes up for all cases, but we have, we have seen that. And that was one of the things I wanted to describe. If you'll allow me, I know we, we have to be a little bit short on time, but I do want to describe this to you that um, many people uh, are familiar with the daycare for the, the senior daycare or the senior centers that provide socialization and they provide programs to help uh, seniors and even those with dementia have good experiences. And uh, very similar to that is what we base our, our daily activities on. And so residents who, um, one of the things you commented on is we went and toured some of the rooms and there was no one in the rooms. Because yeah, they're having a birthday was, party. <laughs> yeah, everyone was out in the great room and celebrating and together. And even we've talked about these levels of care that everyone's in a different condition, but they were all gathered around singing happy birthday and um, having that party atmosphere. So during the day we have Everyone does the dining out of their rooms. They do the activities out of their rooms. They do physical exercise. Some do range of motion exercise. We have an in-house therapy team that's here to provide in-house therapy. Uh, we do a lot of musical activities. And that's one thing that almost every resident responds to is a good musical act or you know, uh, someone that plays the piano well or someone that'll come in. We have them the live musicians really make a huge difference in helping residents enjoy that time and being outside of their rooms. And so these are not so much technology, but things that the world has discovered that are beneficial to those with dementia and having those activities and socialization and times spent with a uh, care team and those who, who know how to assist them and provide that ongoing and constant during the day atmosphere uh, that helps residents with dementia. And that's really exciting to us because that's a potentially a huge difference between what's found in, in uh, other locations or um, even in a private home. You can't have a constant uh, flow of musical acts coming into your home uh, <laughs> right <laughs> you know we wish we wish we could but that's one of the blessings of having a community where we do group care is that those things are available all day long I love that and yeah also shout out to the activity <clears throat> coordinators that are in these places they they're like the funnest people ever absolutely so I have a couple important resources. Obviously, uh, Active Care Breast Ranch is a valuable resource of the week. But for physicians listening uh, in California, I want to alert you to a CME called Dementia Care Aware. I did it, and this is for primary care physicians where you can screen patients um, in the cognitive health assessment. And that's where you... Ooh, I'm, I'm putting myself on the spot. You can kind of see where they are with their ADLs, who's their decision maker, and what are some of the things that they're facing in a cognitive health assessment. I'll put it in the chat. 
I mean, not in the chat. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll put it in the show notes so you can look into Dementia Care Aware because it's a valuable program so that we can identify these seniors and set them up to understand resources and the continuum of care. That's also what I want to touch on. Whenever I go around and speak, I want you know, new physicians, community partners to understand the continuum of care. So it starts when they're beginning to forget things, but we know that we, there's a circle of life and it comes to the end of life. Um, some people benefit from hospice, like the work that I do. So what I want to learn from this um, also is how do memory cares uh, facilitate that with the families. I know about it in my work, in my nine to five work, but but I want to make sure the listeners are understanding that Alzheimer's disease or cerebral atherosclerosis, we sometimes label it, or the other types of dementia are diagnoses that are eligible for hospice care when they are declining. So how can we maybe paint the picture of how we would transition to that part of the process when they're in their home of active care? You bet. It's critical that families understand that hospice is not a scary thing. And um, it doesn't mean that your loved one's going to pass away immediately just because someone's recommended hospice. Uh, we, we partner with many hospice companies and we appreciate their services and it's really a critical part of what we do because uh, they can provide additional care, they can provide additional resources. We have a sounding board to work with other teams and um, sometimes it's helpful if, if residents are prone to, to falling or they're, they're having difficulties then uh, hospice can assist. Just to, They're just as important as other uh, parts of the team with, I mentioned therapy and things like that. And sometimes you can do hospice and therapy together. So a uh, very important and critical part of, of what we do in a community. And we do not ever want families to be scared of the word hospice because uh, usually it simply means more assistance and, and more visits by the professional team to come into the building and do house calls. And so that's, yeah. that's really what I uh, look to for hospice. And so we, we love having that assistance and, and they're great partners. Yeah. And what folks can understand, you know, I, I created my own little definition of hospice. It's just healthcare brought to the home mm -hmm. and it's team based. So when you're to a point where you can't go back and forth to your primary care doctor, or you don't have a mobile physician, like morning dove. Uh, sometimes you, it is best to elect for, for the hospice benefit so you can have the interdisciplinary team checking on your, your loved one at their memory care facility yeah. and they report back to you, but they work in conjunction with them to make sure that people have everything they need uh, during these Absolutely. late stages of life. So, Absolutely. Thank you for addressing that and saying families shouldn't be scared because, you know, that is my mission uh, to make, um, you know, our, our society hospice friendly so people aren't scared of the H word. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I uh, people probably sick of me telling them to uh, interview a hospice, uh, even friends and people that are, are having difficulties uh, mm. in their personal situation with families that family members that are declining it's it's a great resource i agree yeah, yeah. So, um well i was as we were discussing that i wanted to uh, provide a, a little bit of background on what we also feel coincides with with that uh circle of life that you mentioned because uh, alzheimer's and dementia and, and the different dementias are, uh, we don't have a cure yet. And so they are fatal, it's a fatal disease. And so we do have a continuum of care right here in our building. And so we do offer those three levels of care and can, can have that way a resident, we've found that dementia residents do, do best and they thrive when they have a routine and they don't have to have these severe changes and, and moving and getting, relocated is a is a big 
issue for someone with dementia. So we don't want to have that happen frequently. And so having everything available and that's what active care uh, is. The, the whole concept is it's memory care from the, we, it was built from the ground up specifically for memory care. And so there's not a wing for uh, one type of care and a wing for uh, uh, another or, or the, the country club wing and the things like that. Right. It's all memory care. It's built from the ground up to be specifically for memory care. And that's really a, a model that uh, we see is very effective and, and we've proven that. And so I, I want to mention that, that the resident can stay with us and, and they can have that routine and families will see the difference when they're able to uh, find their, find the care and, and find their loved one when they, when they come to visit or when they are participating alongside and, and seeing how well they're doing that that's really a testament to how this system works. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think we covered everything, but I'm actually curious, maybe you can help us. Um, we'll just answer this question. Okay. What is the shortest length of stay you've seen? It may be the longest because I mm. sometimes get family members when they're watching their, their loved one, forget about them and not be themselves. It's mm -hmm. very agonizing and difficult for yeah. them. And so I've been asked before, oh, how long is it going to be? You know, I've even had a wife say to the team, can he just take something and go to sleep? And, it, and we're like, no. Um, yeah. But, you know, just we have compassion for them because it's just so hard. They've been married for 40, 50, 60 years yeah. and to see them yeah. continue to decline. They see it as suffering. Mm -hmm. So could you give us kind of maybe the shortest time someone stayed mm -hmm. there, maybe the longest to give people a picture of how it looks? Cause they don't always hear mm -hmm. this from their yeah. uh, primary care doctor or neurologist, sure. or maybe they don't remember. I don't, I don't know, but yeah. um, let's let them know from this. Okay. Well, the difficult thing is we don't know, right. That every person is different and, and that's what makes this disease and, and treating the disease so difficult is everybody. It affects everybody differently. And what I can say is that we do offer a minimum uh, 30 day respite. And so that'll, that would allow someone who, you know, you mentioned a, a wife that's saying, can he just go to sleep? That's caregiver burnout. That's a wife yes. that needs to take a break, um, go, go travel and visit the rest of her family and take a break and then come back and see if there's been any um, uh, good result of her husband being in respite and potentially she'll choose to leave him with us. And we have a lot of families that do that. They make that choice. The respite went very well. He's uh, very happy. Um, and when we see that, that that's a way to test it out. Mm -hmm. um, some, some people come to us on, they're already on hospice services and, and we, we accept someone that's already on hospices services and they, um, are with us for a matter of days sometimes, you know, that we, we never know. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes that's difficult to think that someone will be with us for months or years and they only are with us for, for a short time. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the um, hard parts is to, to see that happen, but that is a reality. And we do have residents that have been with us for many years. Um, one of our founding residents, this building was built 12 years ago, and we have a resident that's been with us for 12 years. Whoa. <laughs> that's, that's very rare for this disease, but um, some residents uh, have uh, been receiving services for you know, five, 10 years. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. And listeners, I will put all these things in the show notes, information about mild cognitive impairment, the different types of dementia for the physicians, dementia care aware in California. So you could get that CME and um, also the link to Active Care Breast Ranch. So you know about that. So thank you for joining me, Jason. I had a great time. Thank you for letting me share. And thanks for the work that you do. It's important. And we, we do want everyone out there to know that 
um, it's, it's not your fault. You know, you can't, you, you just have to get some help sometimes. And uh, let's all remember the, your, the great phrase. Who, who was it that, that coined it to uh, moving home? Oh, Brenda Lee Smith. The Thanks, Oasis. Brenda. <laughs> Oasis Brenda. Senior Advisor. Sometimes all you right. have to move, move home when it no longer, longer serves you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I enjoyed myself and we wish everyone well. All right. Thanks, Jason. Peace, everyone. Bye-bye.